A very good afternoon, distinguished guests, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jia Hao and I have the pleasure of being your MC for today. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies at NUS, I welcome you to this afternoon's panel discussion titled Pakistan under Imran Khan, a new dawn. To start the proceedings, I would like to introduce the following distinguished panelists for our stage. First, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh, Visiting Research Associate Professor, ISIS and US. Professor Riaz Hassan, Visiting Research Professor, ISIS and US. Mr. Shahid Javid Burki, Visiting Senior Research Fellow, ISIS and US, and former Finance Minister of Pakistan. And Professor Raja Mohan, Director, ISIS and US. Chairing the session is Ambassador Gopina Pillai, Chairman ISIS and US, and Ambassador at Large, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore. I now hand over the floor to Ambassador Pillai. Ambassador Pillai, please. Krishna, Ambassador Rakhine, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I prefer to stand and talk. The words flow better. When you sit down, you can stand on somewhere. On the 18th of August, the new Prime Minister was sworn in in Pakistan. With that, I says, my own betting average went up. <laughs> because both the Prime Minister, now we can claim, both the Prime Ministers of India and Pakistan were our guests long before they became Prime Ministers. That shows foresight from our part. <laughs> Today we have, as uh, Chen uh, introduced, a very distinguished group of people to discuss the subject, uh, whether it's a new dawn or not a new dawn, or whether it's more of the same. Before I hand over to the various speakers, I call on the various speakers, I would like to make a few points, like for me for three points, but mine may be more than three points. I'm an Indian, you know, I can more things to say. <clears throat> First, when Mr. Imran Khan became Prime Minister, or when the prospects of that began to emerge, there were a lot of speculation. What sort of Prime Minister would he be? Would he be a tool of the army? Uh, how would he deal with the foreign affairs, particularly in India? So my comments are based on this group. The general belief is that he came into the support of the army and therefore he will continue to be uh, the golden weapon and he will work in such a way that he is very close to them. I have a slightly different view on this because of two factors. First, I do not think that he will be a total poodle uh, for the army. I think he's a man of his own. He's building himself with his own personality, his charisma, and uh, the way he switches uh, his voltage uh, according to the, the audience. So he will continue to do that. But I feel that he may be someone who can build up uh, a following on his own and may not be totally dependent, may not have to be totally dependent on the army. First, the army itself may have some, some misgivings on being uh, being his sort of uh, the, 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 the ones to lead the, the, the troops, as it were. Because uh, in the past, the army was totally, you know, uh, they're powerful, they had very, very rich allies in the United States. The Chinese, who are now the main ally of uh, Pakistan are less likely to monikoto the army or the ISI as they have been in the past. So I don't think if Imran Khan can build up his own following, which I think it's not difficult for him to do 
given his charisma, his reputation, his ability to speak openly, his two stated aims, two or three. One is that he will be a good Muslim, he will lead an uh, uncorrupted, uncorruptible regime, and three, that uh, he will bring in 10 million jobs in the next five years. If he can do these things, he can remain clean, he can be a good Muslim, and he can provide the jobs, I think he need not be beholden to the army that much. And therefore, I think you probably would have a more independent. The second point is regarding foreign affairs. And in his uh, opening address or inaugural speech, he did mention about uh, building up good relations with Afghanistan and India. Here, I'm not sure he will be that successful. Both India and Pakistan have spent their best efforts trying to vilify each other. I think they spend more resources, Pakistan for instance, more resources on building up India as the enemy. India is quantum of uh, vilification was divided between two or three countries. So not, it's a little bit more diluted. But Pakistan is central. Uh, you go to a school, you go anywhere, enemy, uh, Dushman, okay, India. It is very difficult to change it. Very difficult to reverse this. And therefore, I have some misgivings <laughs> on whether he will succeed. But if we Iran, whatever he has been saying, that he's able to bring it to fruition, he may succeed. I've seen Indians and Pakistanis who are, may not be the best of pals uh, in the subcontinent. Outside, in Singapore, for instance, I've seen them having no problems at all. I'll give you one <coughs> short example. Two, no, three years ago, our South Asian Diaspora Conference on the main table was Anand Mahendra of Mahendra and Mahendra, well-known company in India. And there was another gentleman from Pakistan. I can't remember the full name, but it was Dao. And they started to talk and so on. Then suddenly it emerged <coughs> that their grandfathers were partners in India. Mahendra and Mahendra was actually Mahendra and Muhammad. And Muhammad migrated to Pakistan and they had to fill in what, because they were known as M and M. So he decided, repeat Mahendra. So, but how well they got on, like you know, on a ball of fire, no? who's that term? But there was no ill will, there was so much of camaraderie, and I felt that can't this be repeated? I think if friends of both India and Pakistan, let me mention Singapore, for instance, if we work in such a way to <coughs> nudge them a little closer, let them see the good in our. I am done the business with Pakistan long before I became a diplomat and everything else. And my agent is in uh, Karachi. was a gentleman by the name of Iqbal Puri. It was standard every time I go there, I will end up with a meal in his house. He will have a whiskey. Sorry to say that, but he will enjoy the whiskey. Uh, and I will have some nice Tea. And we will end up with a very good Hindi movie. The latest, which I have not seen in Singapore, he will see. And once when he found out that my favorite actress used to be No Delan, and the, my favorite movie was Jugnu, he was over the top. You know, he said, fantastic. We, I didn't know you could speak Hindi and you could do this. 
you know. So, there is so much common between Pakistan and India. Why they don't see it, I'm not sure. Are they, you know, you know, some whale comes to the, the moment they look in that direction, I'm not sure. But that's what's happening. But this may be an opportunity with friends and relatives moving in to try to develop. Because then South Asia will have a meaning. Now, for instance, Singapore, we, we do a lot of things with India. We do with, uh, with, uh, with Sri Lanka, a little bit with Bangladesh. And so on. But it's incomplete. Again, going back to my South Asian diaspora conference a few years ago, Mr. Tarun Das, mentor of CII, made an audacious proposal. He said, India unilaterally should remove all its trade barriers with countries of South Asia. And India must take the lead. It's the biggest by far. It's the most successful economy. It's the strongest. And so on. He can do that. He was the hero for the two days. Everywhere he turned, people came to me and said, what a wonderful idea. Yes, but it remains just as, a, as one man's view. But this is something that was thinking about. Ladies and gentlemen, I can keep on talking because, you know, Pakistan is one of the countries that I represented as ambassador, as high commissioner, and I have a lot of fond memories. But I think uh, I'm obliged to call the speakers to speak rather than to speak myself. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a very good uh, afternoon. Now maybe I will introduce the first speaker, Iqbal Singh, who is from the University of North Carolina. He's our latest edition. One of the things he's supposed to do is do a book or do some study on Islam in South Asia. This is one of the things that I would very much like myself to do. And he is especially here to do that. And his wife is not here. She's young. Oh, you're here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. My eyesight, you know, is getting old. Uh, she's going to lead a project called for women's role in South Asia. Two very, very important subjects. So, without further ado, let me call on Deepak Singh. Thank you, Um, as we all know, the um, Imran Khan, the former fast bowler who captained Pakistan to the British World Cup champions in 1992, has been sworn in as the 22nd Prime Minister of Pakistan. He, he and his party, the Pakistan Tariq and Saf, have promised to build a new Pakistan or Naya Pakistan. And this has given rise to an amount of not a small amount of enthusiasm among sections in Pakistan and beyond as well, ourselves as we are gathered here as well. However, the, um, the financial crisis confronting Pakistan, the broad social coalition that the PTI had to stitch together to win the elections, and the ever-present role of the military is um, going to make it tricky for Imran Khan in the coming years, and it remains to be seen how he will negotiate I'm going to be shameless and use the first cricket analogy, and the second actually. How he's going to negotiate the sticky wicket of politics. <laughs> I thought very hard about this one, so I had to try to do it. Now, what I, what I propose doing in my, um, my talk is um, maybe to highlight some broader points about the election process itself, some of the results that emerged, and then go into some of the two or three of the key issues, and then evaluate uh, the PTI's position in Pakistan. So I've often been asked about the electoral process in Pakistan, so I'm going to start with that. Bear with me if you're already familiar with this. Um, of course, in, on the 25th of July 2018, Pakistanis voted for a national assembly and a provisional assembly, so the both national and provincial 
elections themselves. Now, if we just look at the National Assembly itself, there are 272 elected constituencies. But added to this, there are 70 seats that are reserved for women, uh, women and minorities, 60 for women, 10 for minorities. And these are divided up among the parties that are elected on a proportional representational basis. So the total of National Assembly, uh, the total number of seats in the National Assembly is actually 342, which makes the magic number for governance 171. Um, if anybody is interested in the dynamics of provincial politics as well, Punjab as a province itself has 141 out of the 270 elected constituencies. So who wins Punjab as a national politics itself? Up till, up till the recent election, the two major parties in the center have been the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, PML, PML and, and the PPP, or the Pakistan People's Party. Um, the PTI, Imran Khan's party, has been a minor player until 2018. And in the 2018 results, the PTI won 149 seats. Um, and this constitutes 31.8% of the vote share. The PMLM, Nawaz Sharif's party, won 82 seats, which constitutes 24% of the vote share. And the PPP won 54 um, seats. Itself, it costs you about 13%. The reason I emphasize that is that if you, if, if by any chance the opposition actually comes together, these numbers are, are rather close. So I just want to throw that out itself. And the PTI has formed a government in coalition with smaller parties, and I won't go into details about that itself, but perhaps we could, we could see where this leads us to the question answers. Now, these numbers aside, there are a number of issues that emerge in this election that are worth paying attention to. One is the fact that the very fact that there was a democratic transition is important itself. This is only the second time in the history of Pakistan that an elected body has actually transitioned power to another elected government itself. So this is this is a momentous moment for Pakistan itself. Having said that, the transition has not been as smooth as Imran Khan or the PTI would have hoped for. Procedural, procedural errors on the part of the Election Commission of Pakistan Accusations against the military of having influenced the results in favor of the PTI have raised concerns over the legitimacy of the elections themselves. And I won't go into too much of details about this, except to point out that, um, that these accusations, some, at some level, these accusations need to be taken very seriously because they start way before the voting process itself. So, and this time around in the elections, it's not accusations about vote rigging per se in the booths, but about censorship and oppression prior to the elections itself. So let's that's, that's, uh, go into this later itself. But within Pakistan, there's been a lot of coverage on this. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan on July 23rd, 2018 had issued uh, this report, which it highlighted censorship against newspapers by what it describes as the establishment itself. And to this is the fact that Imran Khan himself, in the past, has been very critical of the electoral process himself. He's often described elections as being systematically rigged. So going forward, one of the things he needs to do is um, so serious efforts to build the credibility of the system itself. Um, so far, he said that he would investigate, the government would investigate um, any charges of rigging. What he's not really spoken about are the issues of censorship uh, from the establishment itself. So that, that remains to be seen itself. Now, these accusations of the elections being stolen seem to unite the opposition parties momentarily. So the Nawaz Sharif's party and the BPP and the MMA, which is a bloc of religious parties, actually did come together for a little while to pose a challenge to Imran Khan's uh, claim to uh, governance itself. Now, this was short-lived as the PPP, so we are familiar with this, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but the PPP abstained from the vote um, when it came to the vote over the Prime Minister. Imran Khan got 176 votes, and Sabah Sharif, who was counting on the PPP votes as well, um, also left with 96, 96 votes. Now, going forward, where this is interesting is while this opposition unity has fallen apart at this stage, there are talks about them coming together to put up a joint candidate for the position of the press, presidential elections, which are due soon as well. So, we need to keep an eye out about the opposition negotiations happening. 
The other major issue that um, was discussed um, extensively, especially um, in foreign media, about the election was the number of religiously right-wing candidates who stood in these elections. Um, most of them lost, lost very badly as well, so that's an interesting thing. But there was one very interesting and new phenomenon that arose with regards to religious right in this election. That is the rise of a new party called the Tehrik -e Pakistan, which had a two-point agenda, Sharia and blasphemy. And this party has actually won two seats in the Sindh Assembly. So their, their electoral victory is not that major in itself. But where it gets interesting is, if you look at the vote share that they won, they're actually the fifth largest party in Pakistan and the third largest in Punjab itself. And they've done better in terms of vote share than established religious parties have done in their national campaigns. So this throws up a new element about this party. And what I'm proposing here is that to understand the rise of this new party, one actually has to look at the changing religious dynamics that are going on themselves as well. And these are dynamics that are being influenced by social media. So the rise of the TLP or the Terry K. the Baik Pakistan I'm proposing is actually due to their extensive use of social media networks that have allowed them to destabilize established religious networks and religious party networks. Um, that were, but of course, there are also rumors about the military having facilitated their rights as well. That's, that's an open question. So, now if I come to the PTI itself, right? I want to I want to put my own view forward. Um, there are there are there are serious allegations about the military's role prior to the election. But to dismiss the PTI victory as, as a creation of the military is unfair. There, is a, there, was, there was serious and um, major enthusiasm um, in support of um, the PTI and Imran Khan. His single-minded um, focus on the issue of corruption drew a lot of support. One should not undermine the, those voters who voted on the basis of this as well. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this, but I do want to highlight two aspects of the BTI's, um, uh, two aspects that contributed to the BTI's rise itself. One is again social media. They emphasis they were very good at using YouTube, Twitter, but also um, the use of apps like the Constituency Management System app, which allowed, um, which was basically a system in which you didn't need that many ground workers to ensure people turn up to vote because you could use an app to monitor who was voting, who was going to vote, and also encourage them to vote. So this, this focus on social media is something that's fascinating and it's more work on in terms of Pakistan. But the other major thing, and I won't take up too much more time, is that Imran Khan was very successful in stitching together a broad coalition of voters. Um, those who were anti-corruption, those who were annoyed by what they saw as realistic provincial politics of the Nawaz Sharif's party and uh, the PPP, etc. But he also made a very conscious effort to appeal to the religiously and socially conservative people. He, on a number of occasions, um, made a calculated decision, I would argue, to raise the blasphemy issue and to indicate his own support for blasphemy laws itself. So this was, this was a calculated move on his part, and we'll go into that later. But he also made an effort, and successful effort, to bring in what are known as electables. These are landed elites, or social elites, or religious elites who basically have a certain cachet of support within voters in certain regions itself. So he managed to integrate them, and many of them moved from the PMLN itself. And this gives rise to a, the question that I want, to, I want to open up here, is that when we assess the issue of whether we are going to see a Naya Pakistan, we actually have to ask how new is Imran Khan's party candidate itself. Because as my la the last time I checked, um, 12 of the cabinet ministers that have been sworn in to the cabinet are actually members who have served under Pervesh Musharraf, Nawaz Sharif, and the PPP governments themselves as well. So you, you're not really getting a new batch of politicians who are coming in to the cabinet positions itself. So, I'll just take a few more minutes. <laughs> so the two questions I want to just end on are, how do you satisfy this major, this broad social <coughs> That's going to be a major problem going forward. But the other issue is about um, the Islamic welfare state that he's promised. The financial crisis in Pakistan means that Pakistan is probably going to negotiate a deal with IMF. Now, I know there's talks about the uh, loan from China, etc. These come with structural adjustments and austerity measures. Now, you, 
I'm not quite certain how you're going to square the circle of, cir square the circle of building the um, Islamic welfare state where you're going to create jobs, you're going to pump money into the universal healthcare system, you're going to pump money into education, etc. Given the economic restraints that, that are existing there. So I'll stop there and pass it on. Thank you, Iqbal. I forgot to mention each speaker has been given only 10 minutes according to Adik Singh's uh, mandate to me. So I will have to stick to it as far as possible, maybe a little bit here and there if I can be, depending on how good you are to be. So, <laughs> the next speaker is my friend, Professor Riyas Hassan, very experienced scholar, very well known scholar. He is mostly in Australia, occasionally he blesses us with his message. This is one of those locations. But please, please Riyas. Thank you very much. I, I have my, uh, I present, I, I prepared a, uh, a short PowerPoint which I thought would make it easier for me to, to address uh, things that I want to, to, to highlight. Uh, how does it which are the main features of, I mean, if you are looking at society, you have to actually have a look at them, demography and geography, uh, and culture. So um, then my next uh, uh, point that I want to highlight is state and society in Pakistan. So let me begin with uh, uh, population. As you can see, population of Pakistan Pakistan is, I think, the sixth largest country in terms of population. 2017 elections uh, estimated a population of 2, 2 208 million, uh, roughly, and, and I think the distribution of age, uh, age distribution is very interesting, which I think has something to do with the elections. 52% 52, 52 of the Pakistanis, the 53% under the age of 24, 37% uh, close to 38% are between 25 and 54 and about 10 sorry yeah and so uh, I mean basically Pakistan is a very young country and uh, a great deal of uh, political processes actually uh, are a product of the age structure of Pakistan society of, Pakistani, uh, of Pakistan now I believe in that, but Pakistan is a very unique country in terms of demography. And I'm not sure how many of you will know that, but uh, I will assume that many, so many of you will be aware. Pakistan has six major ethnic groups. Punjabis, Hindu speaking people, Pashtun, Balochis, and Kashmiris and Sindhis. They are together make, to make up 2.8 million, 208 million people. But each one of these ethnic groups is divided between two or three countries. And I don't think there are many countries in the world which have this particular demographic feature. Punjab has, uh, as you probably know, of 100, and I can't read the, the actual figure. But well, Punjabi is the largest group, and the majority of the Punjabis live in Pakistan, and then, of course, a minority live in, in, in India. Urdu speaking people, who are the, which is the native language, and there are about 70 million uh, Urdu speaking people, of which, well, actually, 100, 100 million, of which only 50 million live in Pakistan, and the rest live in India. Uh, the Pashtun population is probably the most unique. We have about 40, uh, 45 million Pashtuns speaking in the world. And Pashtun think Afghanistan is their whole country. But only 15% of Pashtuns live in Afghanistan, and the rest live in Pakistan. So Pakistan is the largest Pashtun country in the world. 
And Karachi is the largest city, Muslim city in the world, larger than Kabul and, and, uh, and, and Peshawar. And then the Sindhis, a majority of them live in Pakistan, a small minority in India. The Baluchi population is again, again, it's a small, but it's divided between Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And then you have the Kashmiris, which are 30% live in Pakistan and then 70% in India. Now, I'm not, I, I'd like you to leave, I'd like to not dwell on this, I just want to, do, to highlight one very important demographic feature. The six ethnic groups which make up Pakistan, these ethnic groups are not uh, relatively new. These are groups which have long historical memories and they are very distinctive cultural units. And one of the very important uh, uh, fall line in Pakistan is Pakistan's uh, demographic composition. And the other very important uh, feature of Pakistan is its geography. Not only demography, but Pakistan's geography just basically highlights that its population divided between various countries. Now, one of the very important feature of Pakistan is the largest border. It has largest borders with two countries, one with Afghanistan and one with India. Now, Afghanistan is the fall of Afghanistan is now the melting pot of almost all global conflicts, all kinds of global conflicts. And Pakistan has very limited control over what happens in, Pakistan, in, in Afghanistan. But Pakistan is deeply affected, it's very intertwined. Pakistan, what happens in Afghanistan is, is has deep, uh, major impact on Pakistan. What happens in Pakistan, Pashtun population, has an impact on Afghanistan. And India, again, again, Pakistan's relationship with India, as you well know, has been very patchy, very uh, 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 hostile over the years. And this, again, it makes it very difficult, uh, very important for, for, for people, for, for Pakistani uh, society to actually, I mean, it makes it very difficult in terms of political process in Pakistan. Now, which, which brings me to one of the points that I want to highlight, the implication of demography and geography for the governments. Uh, you see, Pakistan, as a nation, nation state, Pakistan has boundaries, and these boundaries are to be protected and defended by the army. So the army is the defender of Pakistan's territorial integrity and national sovereignty. Now, we know that Pakistan already had had a major fracture, Bangladesh became independent, East Pakistan became Bangladesh, so that's already there has been a fracture in Pakistan as a result of the demography and geography. Now, military role in shaping, consequently military as a result of its demography and geography, military has played a very vital role in, the, in, in political processes in Pakistan. And that's probably one reason why they, there has been a very tense relationship and the often striving relationship between civilian uh, rulers and, and military leadership. And I just wanted to mention that this is not the general sit down and say, well, I think we should do something about these civilian leaders. That's not the case. It's the very institutional arrangement that evolved out of the demography and geography of Pakistan, which has actually given military, uh, which had made military-civilian relationship very problematic in Pakistan. The third feature of Pakistani society is religion. Now, Pakistanis are very, uh, and this is a, if you can see this, it's a study of about, uh, I've conducted about eight countries. And this is only one index of orthodoxy of religious beliefs, and Pakistan is way ahead of any other countries uh, uh, in, in the state. I mean, two-thirds of Pakistanis, uh, 76 of, 78 percent of Pakistanis, uh, percentage in, in terms of percentage uh, are auto, have orthodox religious belief at least. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to talk more about it if you like. The other thing which is very important in Pakistan, and I've been on holiday due to by my colleague Iqbal Singh, is Islamization and Hadood laws. So, Pakistanis in general have very close affinity, very, they, are devote, they, are, they, are very, they have great attachment to their faith. And, and it will reinforce through the introduction of the laws and Islamization policy 
for the Pakistan industry, particularly after the Zia and Pakistan regime. Now, does it affect Pakistan's voting? Do Pakistan's Pakistani devotion to religion affect their voting behavior? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Because over the last uh, several elections, religious parties have not won more than have won, won more, more than, never won more than 10%, but usually between 5 and 9% of the votes. This time they won about 9.2% of the vote. And so the majority of the Pakistanis vote for center-left, centrist, and center-right parties, which essentially are the PTI, PML, Aksan Masundi, and PPP. So, it's, but it's a very interesting feature of Pakistan is that Although Pakistanis appear to be very devoted to the faith, but when it comes to elections, they do not vote for religious parties. In fact, religious parties have won very rarely any more than 10% of the vote. And this year, this, in this election, and the other thing that's very interesting about Pakistan election, in 2008, it was the uh, PPP who won the election. 2013, it was Muslim League with one the elections, and 2018, it was the PTI. So, obviously, people in Pakistan, voters in Pakistan, do have some sense of what they want to do. So, every election, in all three elections, the previous three elections, Pakistanis have actually switched their voting pattern and brought another party to power. So I'd like you to, 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 to let you reflect on it. No, religious parties are basically spoilers. I mean, they are not really, they're, they're particularly the party that uh, Iqbal mentioned, Tahrik uh, Labek Pakistan. It is now the third largest party. It has, it won 2.9% of the vote. 2.5%, uh, sorry, 4.9% uh, of the vote and 2.1 million, uh, 2.5 million votes. And the other party that won is the MMA, which won also the same amount of vote than 2.5 million and all about that. Now, the region of Pakistan is only two um, uh, slogan party, Khatm and and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, blasphemy, but basically it's Khatm and Now, interesting thing, the region of Pakistan is a brave party, which is what I call the folk Islam, the popular Islam, whereas MMA is a more orthodox uh, 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 party, Yobandi parties. So one of the very important consequences of the Hague Elevate Pakistan is that it has taken 2.5 million votes, and most of these votes came from Muslim League. As a result of that, it's a spoiler because it has won only two seats in in the uh, in, in Sindh Assembly, but none it's the third largest party in Punjab, but has not won a single seat in Punjab, either in the National, National Assembly or in the Provincial Assembly. But what it has done, it has actually probably resulted in Muslim League losing something like 16 seats uh, in the National Assembly and almost 20 to 25 seats in the Provincial Assembly. So in fact, Tariq and Labe Pakistan deprived uh, uh, the Muslim League from making, from, uh, from making farming government in, in, in Punjab. So it has, uh, it has not won any election, but it has actually very seriously affected the Muslim League uh, vote, vote bank. Because Muslim Leagues are primarily, uh, Muslim League voters are primarily are uh, Bareilly voters. Now, the other thing, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, basically about I mean, basically, I wanted to talk about is Pakistan a failed state, and I, I just wanted to show you uh, how Pakistanis actually view various institutions in Pakistan. This was this is about six months old uh, uh, survey, and you can see that the most trusted institution in Pakistan is army, and the least trusted institution are police, politician, parliament, and political parties. So there is a problem in Pakistan. So you can see the difficulties uh, civilian leaders have because there's a great deal of 
affect the support among Pakistanis for the army. But when you ask Pakistanis, by the way, do you want an army dictatorship or democracy, 90% of Pakistanis say they want democracy, and 10%, a little, little more than 10%, say they want military dictatorship. Just because they support army does not mean that they want military dictatorship. Uh, is Pakistan a failed state? Uh, if you look at the social economic indicators, by and large, it has not been going as well as Bangladesh or India. Uh, but Pakistani state has been delivering some social and economic uh, well, uh, 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 well-being uh, to for, its, for the citizens. Uh, has Pakistani state been response, uh, successful in controlling terrorism, which is Pakistan is considered to be the Made one of the major states of communication terrorists. Now, if you look at this figure over the last uh, 16 years, the terrorism has both terrorism, both suicide terrorism, and other type form of terrorism have actually they skyrocketed in the mid in the nine, 2008 and nine. But if you look at the 2018 figure, they have actually come down. Pakistan state has actually been successful in controlling terrorism, in, in, in at least making a big dent in terrorist uh, uh, incidents. And if you look at this figure, uh, if you look at the fatalities, uh, terrorist fatalities, uh, deaths uh, as a result of terrorist violence, uh, there were altogether 62,000 terrorist deaths in the years that you are looking at between 2003 and 2017, of which 21,000, 22,000, close to 22,000 civilian deaths. And 7,000, close to 7,000 were actually deaths of the army and police. They were the security personnel. And the 33 million, uh, 33,000 were actually terrorists. So for the state which is, you know, spending which, which is actually losing a substantial number of uh, its own personnel, uh, security forces personnel, obviously is doing something, and the rewards are basically, and the consequences are that their terrorism has actually declined uh, quite significantly. Now, finally, if you just look at Pakistan, how Pakistan sees the major problems, I mean, basically, the Pakistani see major problems, not terrorism, but essentially they see law and order uh, in unemployment, inflation and corruption, between these are more or less make, make up the majority of the problems, and the rest of them uh, have a smaller proportion. Now let me conclude by uh, just making a one up, a couple of observations. Pakistan elections have actually resulted in change of governments. Not only change of governments, but change of parties over the last you know, three elections. So elections are important in the political system of Pakistan, and societies uh, obviously have, the people in Pakistanis do have some uh, judgments which they make, serious judgments they make when it comes to elections. And there are more and other examples I can share with you, but I won't have time. Now, religious laws. None of the three parties, PTE, PTI, PPP, and Muslim League, are going to do anything about religious laws. They have all openly uh, supported blasphemy laws, which are really quite, uh, I think, some of the Islamic laws are very unfortunate for a modern country like Pakistan. But they've all supported blasphemy laws. In fact, the Grand Khan has openly said that he, if there were no blasphemy laws, people would be, Pakistan would be, would be killing each other. And when it comes to, so the, none of the three parties are really interested in reforming, are doing anything about. Uh, either abrogating or modifying the Islamic laws, which I think uh, are very serious uh, uh, blot on, on Pakistani society. Now, finally, about the Islamic welfare state, which Imran Khan has said he would like to introduce. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he means. I think he means zakat. Now, Ziaul Haq, zakat is, those of you who don't know, is 2.5% of the, the total income that Muslims are, are required to, to give to the for, for charity. And there are very specific uh, injunctions where the card can be spent. But it's just a form of institutionalized welfare system within Pakistan. 
from its own luck try to uh, actually legalize the card, collection of the card by the state. Most Pakistanis start giving the card to the state. Because the card is distributed, and I have a whole chapter devoted to this book in my book, in my book uh, Inside Muslim Mind. When, we, when Muslims give the card, and Pakistan is in particular, and this too in Malaysia as well in Singapore, when people give the card, uh, Muslims give the card, they give first, mostly rich people give the card, first they give to the poor relatives. Secondly, they give to the servants, the people who are working for them. Uh, it could be a big landlord giving to the, the people, people who are working in the farm or industries. And the third thing they will give to either to mosque in the region, in the, in the locality, or to the teachers who are teaching in the mosque. So um, if Imran Khan, I have no idea when why Muslim, Muslim leaders want to develop on this idea of, of welfare, part, Muslim, Islamic welfare state, because I, I don't think they understand either the history or the nature. So in conclusion, I think one of the, the biggest asset that Pakistan has in Imran Khan is that he's an honest man, he's young. At the same time, he is uh, supported by a relatively young population. But I personally think that given Pakistan's geography and demography, uh, there is a, I, I think it would be a remarkable achievement if Imran Khan delivers uh, any more than other than more of the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. Um, before I call the next speaker, John, is there some way we can decrease the temperature a little bit? Those of us wearing jackets, we are... Maximum. This, this is a maximum in terms of higher temperature or lower temperature? <laughs> both, both. 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 We've opened the doors behind. That's something else. Oh. Okay, we have to suffer in silence. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Javed Burki, former Finance Minister of Pakistan, a well-known World Bank economist. Yeah. Like the chairman, I feel more comfortable speaking by standing on rather than sitting. Uh, just a couple of points uh, which I'd like to pick up from Riyadh's uh, uh, excellent presentation. And that kind of ties up into what I would like to say. One, he emphasized on the youth of the Pakistani population. Uh, and he put a lot of emphasis on demography and geography. Uh, Pakistan has one of the youngest population in the world. Uh, its median age is about 23.5 years, which means 50% of the population is below the age of 23.5. What's not realized uh, by uh, people who talk about the youth of the population is that the population of major cities is very young. <coughs> I've done some estimate of this. Uh, something like 75% of the population of cities like Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, Faisalabad, the major cities of the country are below the age, 75% below the age of 23-24. And a lot of them are male. These people have migrated from the countryside, from the smaller cities and gone to the larger cities. And they have aspirations. Their aspirations are similar to what produced uh, the Arab Spring in 2011. And uh, Imran Khan knows about this, and I think he is going to react to this if he wants to satisfy his main constituency. The point I want to make, and I think it's an important point to understand what's happened in Pakistan is, that there is an enormous, a significant shift in Pakistani politics from the rural areas to the urban areas. Imran is a candidate of the urban youth. It's a very different constituency from the constituency that elected the previous governments, PP, uh, PMLN and PPP. The only place where I would disagree with Riyadh 
is the last sentence that he used in his presentation, which was uh, that Imran is not going to make any difference. I think Imran is going to make an enormous amount of difference to the way Pakistan is governed, to Pakistan's position in the global system, to Pakistan's relations with the world outside, in particular its neighbors. And he's already started out uh, in that direction. Uh, just a couple of points before I start talking about economics. Uh, I'm pre producing what I hope will be a major book on the 2018 elections. And it is not going to be so much an analysis of the elections as putting elections in the context of uh, what Pakistan has been, has become, and is likely to become uh, the first to relate to the first 71 years. And the last point is about what may happen uh, in the next 10 years. My guess is that Imran will have a minimum of 10 years in office. I think he will win. Uh, win is a strong word to use, but I think he will win the next election, which will be 2023. And if that happens, he would become the longest serving uh, Prime Minister in Pakistan's history. And that will happen because he should be able to deliver uh, what the urban folks want from him. We've already heard uh, uh, from Riaz's uh, excellent presentation on religion and politics and so on and so forth. In order to prepare for the work that I'm doing, I read up everything that has been written in the last two months in four publications, The Economist, The Guardian of London, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. I was struck by one thing, and I sat down and I took notes and I wrote about two, three pages of what I call the Pakistan narrative. And what's amazing is how negative this narrative is. Uh, the way the West in particular, but some in Pakistan also, view Pakistan is extremely negatively. Uh, some uh, couple of my, uh, not couple of, some people over here in ISIS have talked about Pakistan standing on the brink of economic disaster. Pakistan is going to have a financial crisis. Pakistan is going to suffer this, that, and the other. None of that is going to happen. Where this picture comes from is hard to understand, maybe because the West relates what's happening in Pakistan to Islamic extremism and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of it happens. A lot of it comes from Pakistanis themselves. I had an excellent lunch with uh, <coughs> a German Pillay and I was telling him that I had a meeting with uh, L.K. Advani, uh, the BJP leader, some years ago. And he said to me, let me ask you, that I will make an observation and then ask you a question. The observation is that we Indians love India. You Pakistanis don't like Pakistan. And I said, uh, why have you concluded this? He said, I read a lot of stuff that Pakistanis write about their own country. You don't see that kind of stuff being written by Indians when they are outside India. They go after each other a lot when they're in India, but once they step outside, they become uh, ambassadors of India. There's a woman who writes very regularly in Pakistan. She writes for the Washington Post. She once asked, uh, asked me out for lunch. And she said to me, tell me, is my reporting negative? I said, well, it's not positive. <laughs> she, said, she said, you know, I have a problem. I live in Islamabad. And I go to a lot of parties. All the alcohol is banned in Pakistan. There's a lot of drinking at those parties. So people loosen up and so on. And I seldom hear Pakistanis talk well about their own country. I'm a reporter, I write what I hear. And therefore, this is what you read uh, about the stuff I write. I make the point about narrative for one simple reason, that one of the seven things that Imran is talking about, that he would like to do on the economic side, <coughs> is make Pakistan self-reliant. Pakistan has been extremely dependent on foreign largesse, a lot of it coming from the United States. The United States 
doesn't provide free money. It gives money when it is in its interest to do so. The United States gave a lot of money to Pakistan three times in its 70 year history. And on all three occasions, that money produced very high rates of GDP growth, about 7% a year. The moment its strategy was, see, its strategic interest was taken care of, the United States left Pakistan. It has gone into Pakistan three times, it has left Pakistan three times. This time, I think it is, it is understood in Pakistan that they cannot depend in the, on the United States. They must be self-reliant. And self-reliance also means being able to attract both foreign capital and uh, capital that has left Pakistan to come back into Pakistan. And there the narrative becomes very important. That's why I'm focusing on the narrative. If the narrative switches from very negative to relatively positive, I think people will begin to take interest in uh, in Pakistan's future. I mean, those of you who indulge in stock markets know that the price of stocks is determined by what the markets think is going to happen to that stock in the future. Economists also put a lot of uh, emphasis on confidence as a contributor to economic performance. Now, uh, very briefly, what Imran would like to do, and I was drawing up a list of uh, uh, the things that he had talked about, and I've already mentioned uh, uh, self-reliance as one of his objectives. He's also very keen on national integration. And this is the point that Yaz made beautifully in putting the numbers that he did. And it's interesting that this his party is the only one which has not presence in all the other in all provinces of Pakistan. This is not the only one that can be described as a national party rather than a regional party. It's very interesting that his choices for major jobs in the country, like Speaker in the National Assembly, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, the Chief Minister of Punjab, and so on. They are all people from backward areas. Nobody had heard of uh, the guy who's become the Chief Minister of Punjab. He is from Deraghazi Khan, which is one of the least developed areas of Punjab and also of Pakistan. So he is very conscious of the fact that for developing Pakistan, he needs to have leadership that belongs to the less developed uh, uh, parts of the country. He had a government in uh, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, which did relatively well compared to all the previous governments before him. And one of the things that he talks about constantly is planting a billion trees. And I have not visited KP province uh, in the last few years, but people tell me that there's a visible uh, change that has taken place in the landscape of that province that trees are now uh, sort of uh, one foot, two, two feet high and so on. So these are the kinds of things uh, that he is talking about when he's talking about regions. Uh, one thing that pleases me about this program is to be able to work with the neighbors and focus on trade as an instrument of bringing countries together. I have been with ICS now for a number of years, and I have been emphasizing to folks over here, and as well as uh, people that I've spoken out, outside, uh, on the outside, that it is extremely important for South Asia to begin to behave like a region, rather than a bunch of countries that do not get along with one another. Imran is making at least positive noises in that direction. His first uh, formal statement, which he gave after being sworn in, uh, talked about using trade as the instrument of collaboration, cooperation, working together with both India and Afghanistan. Now, it is incredible that Pakistan has signed a an arrangement, uh, a transit arrangement with Afghanistan, which is one way. It allows Afghan goods and commodities to go from Afghanistan to India, but not the other way around. And my question is, why not? What's the, what's the problem with that? You benefit, 
your trucks will be used, your service sector will liven up and so on and so forth. It is to Pakistan's advantage to be able to do this. He's not said so in so many words, but I think that's what he's implying when he is talking about uh, uh, about using trade as an instrument of collaboration, cooperation with the neighbors. He has also indicated that he would like to have a relationship with the United States that is based on mutual respect. Now, it is amazing how the government of uh, uh, Mr. Trump has used Pakistan, has condemned Pakistan, has used abusive phrases about Pakistan, and then yet expect that there will be collaboration between Islamabad and Washington. I had a conversation with a former uh, foreign minister of Pakistan when he was visiting Washington, and I said to him that no self-respecting country can take lying down the kind of stuff that Donald Trump has been throwing at you. He's been calling you deceitful, liars, and so on and so forth. How can you possibly relate with this country which is using that kind of language? Uh, Imran Khan has said very clearly that he is not going to sell out to the United States that if U.S. has strategic interests, Pakistan also has strategic interests. And those will have to be satisfied in order to have the relationship. Now, I don't think it's going to be easy for the United States to make its fourth entry into Pakistan without satisfying Pakistan's aspirations about uh, where it wants to go. Finally, uh, Riyaz uh, put up some numbers about social development uh, on, on the screen. Uh, there are some things that have become uh, sort of part of the normal narrative about Pakistan. And these are not correct things. And one of them, and Imran unfortunately has used the number himself, saying that uh, what presented the Pakistani youth is stunted. And uh, I'm surprised at those kind of numbers because they are wrong. And I've told the World Bank which has been using that number. And finally, uh, he has indicated that he's going to spend a lot of time, a lot of resources in getting social improvement, in getting education and health taken care of. That's what the youth want. That's, those are the people who voted for him, and he better deliver in these areas. Uh, there was a clinking of the glass, which means that my time is over. So thank you very much. <laughs> The final speaker is our director, who was appointed in May, Professor Radha Mohan. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think the foreign policy breaks up the rare, uh, rightly so, because uh, looking from outside in, uh, the foreign policy would look the most important thing for the rest of the world. But when you're inside and looking out, uh, foreign policy is the last uh, subject on your mind that uh, all politics is local, so what happens inside is the one that's going to affect the foreign policy and not the other way around. Whatever the uh, expectations uh, that outsiders might have, uh, it's going to be driven by uh, factors uh, inside. Uh, the title of today's uh, session, I mean, New Dawn, I mean, uh, with a question mark, of course, is essentially saying, is there going to be change? Uh, you could argue that uh, change is inevitable, I mean, taken a sufficiently long time span, everything changes, uh, but if it narrow the time span, it's inertia that continues to prevail. That is, it's very hard to change large countries uh, in, a, in a limited span of time, uh, except when uh, revolutions happen inside a country, or when there is uh, a calamitous external development that forces significant internal change. So the big point, I think you already heard that point uh, in the previous uh, three speakers' presentation, uh, there's a case that's being made that is actually uh, likely to see significant change under Iran Khan to one that it's going to be more of the same. But then, uh, if we had an answer, then we wouldn't be here uh, talking about it. And I think that's the whole purpose that uh, the uh, what comes out uh, at this current juncture uh, will depend on a, on a lot of things. 
Uh, the, when we talk about change, I think it's certainly in the case of foreign policy, uh, the new foreign minister, Shah Mahmoud Qureshi, uh, when he took charge uh, two days ago, went to the foreign office, and he said uh, one very interesting thing. He said, uh, obviously, some journalist was provoking him, uh, where is the foreign policy of Pakistan made? So he said, no, no, it's going to be made in the foreign office. Are we going to make it? Of course, we'll consult the establishment, the deep state, but the foreign policy will be made here. That's how it happens in the rest of the world, and that's what we want to do in Pakistan. Uh, that, of course, that's a, a, a good sentiment, but I think uh, skeptics would say, look, uh, the story of the last many years is actually that the civilians have actually lost ground, and civilian institutions, I would even say, have lost ground in the control uh, of, uh, of foreign policy. And I think both Zardari uh, and uh, Nawaz Sharif, in the last, the two leaders who led Pakistan in the last 10 years, both came to grief trying to rest a role on foreign policy. Whether it is the immediate uh, wake of Bin Laden's uh, uh, attack on Bin Laden, uh, the whole question of whether the U.S. was, Zardari was playing with the U.S. to uh, undermine the, the current structures, or Nawaz Sharif's story, those of you familiar with the Dawn Leaks story, uh, that actually uh, that he was trying to, uh, you know, undermine some key aspects of, of Pakistan policy. So I think that tension endures. But I would say the the question to ask if Imran will change the foreign policy might be the wrong question. The right question, perhaps, is are conditions sufficiently ripe for Pakistan to change course? That is, is there a significant change in the internal dynamic of Pakistan, and is there an external context in which? Pakistan cannot pursue the course that it has pursued in the last 40 years. That is whether it is a question of economy, whether it is a question of foreign policy, that in all these cases, and I think there's a reasonable case to say, even if it is army that's going to run the foreign policy of Pakistan, that there's a room or there's a need, there is an imperative for a reorientation, uh, even a, you can say even a minor recalibration of Pakistan's foreign policy. That case can be made uh, without even a reference to uh, Imran Khan. But Imran Khan, as the chairman said, is a popular figure, as a non, you know, with, with less uh, baggage than any of the previous fellows. So therefore, there is possibility if the army and, and Imran Khan work together, they could produce the change, and he could be the one who can give credibility internally to likely changes in economic strategy or otherwise. So therefore, uh, we should not be too skeptical, we should not be cynical that nothing is going to change, nor we should be uh, talk about a new dawn, that this, everything is going to change. Uh, and I think, uh, I would think, uh, a, a careful, uh, uh, I would say cautiously optimistic expectation, some change is going to happen because of the nature of the conditions that Pakistan faces uh, internally and, and externally today, and I think those conditions we've already discussed. So coming to foreign policy, essentially I would say, there are only three basic issues I want to highlight. One, going back to Shah Mohammad Qureshi, uh, he was speaking at the foreign office, said, uh, we want to end Pakistan's international isolation. So it's not the narrative uh, that outside is saying something. There is a deep feeling in Pakistan that it has lost ground internationally. Uh, that uh, it's got great relationship with China, that's unlikely to change. Uh, it's got new relationship with Russia. But I don't know, picking up Russia as a best friend is this is the smartest course at this point of time. But the fact is that Pakistan's relationship with the US and the West have significantly deteriorated in the last 30 years. Now, I think it's, it's not that, look, Pakistan, can we do without the West? And every country can do it. All of us have tried our middle paths, but none of them has worked. So the, I would say any responsible leadership in Pakistan would want to repair that relationship. Yes, in terms of self-respect on terms of equality, but to say there would be, uh, there is going to be no recalibration, or the Pakistani leadership today is going to believe uh, China is the solution to all the problems. While China is useful, helpful, they would still need a relationship with the West uh, and with the IMF, with the international financial institutions, with the Western structures in general, so that at least Pakistan has some room to negotiate and not merely depend, up, depend upon one country, that is China at this point. So I would say, uh, and Secretary Mike Pompeo is going to be there soon, uh, September 6th, 5th, 6th, some, some point of time. So I would say there would be a negotiation between the US and Pakistan. What would be those terms is what we need to watch. And a priori, whatever the grouse of Pakistan is today, or Imran Khan today, I don't think he can afford to rule out 
an attempt at constructing some, uh, you know, friendship, some normalization of relationship with the West. That takes me to the second issue, though, which is really Afghanistan. Which I haven't talked about India. Uh, I don't think it's number one priority today for Afghanistan. The number one priority is and has to be Afghanistan. Because for the last 40 years, it is the developments in Afghanistan that have driven Pakistan's foreign policy, Pakistan's strategic policy. Whether it's a question of nuclear weapons, uh, whether it is a question of relationship with the West, whether it is the, uh, the nature of Pakistan's strategy generally that it has adopted. And I think the, as Afghanistan today comes back to the brink, 17 years after American occupation, the question today becomes, what is Pakistan going to do? Which is what Americans want to know, that are you going to help us get a deal with the Taliban? Or are you going to go for broke with the Taliban uh, to, for going for a victory of the Taliban? So how the settlement in Afghanistan works out? And that I think, I would think it's a huge opportunity for Pakistan. That a Pakistan that delivers the Taliban for a reasonable accommodation with the current structures in Kabul will have huge rewards to the rewards to reap in the international system. Because the Pak Americans' have, expectations are so low today that even a minimal progress on Afghanistan, with the help of Pakistan, would significantly boost Pakistan's prospects in the West. There's a deal to be made. I don't know what the terms of the deal are, how they're going to be made. But I think that is going to be the key negotiation because there, I think, because Afghanistan not only affected Pakistan's foreign policy, it's very much part of Pakistan's domestic policy. Because there was no jihad as foreign policy instrument before 78-79. What happened in Afghanistan in 78-79, what Zia did to Pakistan inside, they were all part of the same package. So the internal politics of Pakistan are deeply connected to what's happening in Afghanistan. So therefore, the strategy on Afghanistan uh, is going to tell us a lot about what Imran Khan is going to do. People have criticized him as Taliban Khan. Uh, it could actually be an advantage at this point of time. There is someone who can as a friend of the Taliban, if he can preach some moderation, some accommodation, then I think uh, he would have huge benefits to gain. But if he doesn't control it, of course, that it is army and, and Imran Khan together, that, but if, this, if they let loose Taliban today for a victory that uh, they've rejected the ceasefire yesterday, uh, they have not, uh, you know, whether it was the Eid ceasefire you know, in June or now, that, that there is no signal from Taliban that is open for any accommodation. But if Pakistan can't control or does not control the Taliban in the final, what seems to be a final you know, moment in, in Afghanistan, I think that is going to be the uh, key uh, factor of how the rest of the world is going to uh, react to react to Pakistan. Because even China has stakes in a, a stable, less volatile frontier to the southwest. So I think many many questions are tied to on India. India, of course, you can call a nuisance at this point. It is there. Chairman was talking about nudging India in Pakistan. Good luck, but uh, I'm afraid India is not going to be nudged. Nor will Pakistan be nudged into doing things what they don't want to do. But my, my case is not whether Pakistan and India needs to be nudged. I'm saying Pakistan and India have talked when they want to talk. They don't need nudging. So if you go back to the period of 2004 to 2007, Musharraf in Pakistan, and initially Vajpayee and later Mahmoud Singh, Negotiated on Kashmir, they came very close to a, a general understanding, a framework that was agreed. They came close to sorting out the issues of Siachen and Serpi. They came close to opening up for MFN and trade relations, which today uh, Burki Saab is talking about. So they have negotiated. So the question is, can the two sides find a way to frame their negotiation, no, the stated position? Because they have gone beyond the stated position. India used to say terrorism first, Pakistan says Kashmir first. But within that, they've yet, we've shown, we saw in 2004 to 2007, actually they could go beyond the stated position and construct a framework in which they could make advances. So the challenge today is going to be, uh, can that take place? And I think there is room to do that. But, it, but the second part of the 2004-07 story is when you came so close to an agreement, but could not do it. All these agreements I talked about, which means that managing the domestic politics when it comes to negotiation with Pakistan, 
is one of the most difficult things. And I think both Pakistan and India found it very hard to actually be able to take through agreements that were sensible, reasonable, in the interests of both sides, that there's always someone shooting it down. So that takes us back to domestic politics. So I would say domestic politics, politics comes first, foreign policy is a consequence.